Shalom, James Trim here, and we're continuing our series on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and specifically the Damascus Document, Part 2. And uh, before I continue, I need to ask people to please support, donate to support this work. Um, the reason we ask people to uh, donate is so that we can make this work available for free. We don't want to be making it exclusive content or putting it behind a paywall and somehow making it only available to an elite class of people that pay for it. Uh, we're not trying to sell it. We want to make information freely available. Uh, and um, in order to do that, we need your help. So please donate. There is a link in the uh, video description. Uh, where you can donate or you can send donations by donations to uh, uh, by PayPal to donations at uh, donations at WNAE.org. That's W N as in Nancy A E dot org. Okay, we are in uh, the Damascus document and we're on column five, uh, page uh, column five line. 15 and 16, and that's, if you're following along with at least this edition of this book, uh, the version by Weiss, Abang, and Cook, that's page 56. Um, now, in part two, I don't expect to be uh, getting into what the actual Hebrew is. I do have it, and we have referenced it some in part one, uh, and also you may be using a different uh, translation, which is fine. There's a uh, I have several here in my own library. There's uh, one by Vermish, there's one by Gaster, um, uh, et cetera. So uh, really, uh, I don't think this week translation will play a matter in it. Last week, there were some things that we looked at because uh, I didn't like the way that the Weiss, Abeg, and Cook translation rendered some things, and we went back and looked at the original Hebrew and uh, clarified. But this week I don't see that happening. So it says, for in times past, God punished their deeds and his wrath burned against their misdeeds, for they are a people without insight. Uh, that's Isaiah 27, 11. They are a people wandering in counsel, for there is no insight in them. Deuteronomy 32, 28. Now, you'll remember from last week, we're talking here about the uh, Pharisees, effectively, the shoddy wall builders, maybe to a lesser extent the Sadducees, but mostly the Pharisees. For in times past, Moshe and Aharon stood in the power of the Prince of Lights, and Belial raised up Yanis and his brother in, uh, in his cunning when seeking to do evil to Israel uh, the first time. Uh, this is interesting. It rem uh, mentions here the names of the two magicians from Pharaoh's court. Uh, the names of the, uh, at least the names of one of the two, the names of the two magicians are not mentioned in um, Exodus, but they are mentioned in the book of Jasher and in uh, uh, some of the rabbinic literature. Uh, they are mentioned in the Ketuvim Netzarim in, uh, I think in one of Paul's uh, letters to Timothy, uh, by name. And uh, uh, they are mentioned by name here in the Dead Sea Scrolls. At least uh, one of them is mentioned by name. So let us, uh, let us continue. <clears throat> in the time of destruction of the land, the boundary shifters appeared and led astray, and the land was devastated, uh, for they had spoken rebellion against the commandments of God through Moses and also through the anointed of the Spirit, and they prophesied falsehood uh, to turn Israel from following God. Now we're in column six. By the way, the boundary shifters are, again, we're still talking here about the Pharisees. The Essenes were calling them boundary shifters because we're talking about uh, the shoddy, there were shoddy wall builders and there is a principle of, of uh, oral Torah that says, uh, talks about building a fence around the Torah. And here, uh, the Essenes differed with the uh, Pharisees 
not on whether there was an oral law, but on where that boundary is. And uh, uh, they believed that the Pharisees had shifted the boundary and um, were too lenient. Okay, they were going to, uh, as we'll find out later, uh, they were much stricter than the Pharisees in their halakha. Um, but God called to mind the covenant of the forefathers, and he raised up from Aharon insightful men and from Israel wise men. The word insightful and wise, I said I wasn't going to get into the Hebrew, but I'm going to. Uh, they are, the word for insightful here is, is actually bena, men of understanding, men of bena. And uh, then the, uh, um, so he raised up from Aharon insightful men and from Israel wise men, Hachma. So you got Hachma and Bena. And he taught them and they dug the well of knowledge, Da'at. So we have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. By the way, this uh, these are the three top um, attributes of the th of the three pillars of the Godhead in the uh, of the uh, uh, tree of life in Kabbalah, and they are the uh, uh, the source for the name of Chabad, the the Jewish organization known as Chabad. Uh, which actually comes from the first parts of Hachma, Bena, and Da'at, Chabad. Um, the, uh, so he taught them and they dug the well of knowledge. And then uh, there's another scripture quote here from Numbers 21.18. The well the princes dug, the nobility of the people dug it with a rod. The well, now we have the interpretation here, the pesher, if you will, in the language of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The well is the Torah, and its diggers are the captives of Israel who went out of the land of Judah and dwelt in the land of Damascus. Now this gets into some really interesting material about the origins of and who the Essenes really were. Some of this we touched on uh, this coincides with material we touched on, on in part one in earlier material in this scroll, uh, in this document. It says, The well is the Torah, and its diggers are the captives of Israel who went out of the land of Judah and dwelt in the land of Damascus. These are the, uh, this is describing the beginning of the Essene sect. Because God had called them all princes, for they sought him, and their honor was not denied by a single mouth. And the rod is the interpreter of the Torah, of whom Isaiah said he brings out a tool for his work. Isaiah 54, 16. And a rod is uh, also, among other things, a, a standard of measurement. The nobility of the people are those who came to dig the well by following rules that the rod made by living uh, uh, to live by during the whole era of wickedness. Um, this nice phrase, era of wickedness, is a, a, a term that they apparently use to describe the era in which they lived and um, coincides then with the idea of some of the things that Yeshua was teaching about the fact that they were living in a, to, a, to a degree in an era of apostasy. Um, and without these rules, they shall obtain nothing until the appearance of one who teaches righteousness in the last days, or Mori Tzadik. Um, so, what this is telling us is that the sect began where? This is why it's called the Damascus document. In Damascus, that a group of, of uh, Jews uh, went out of the land of Judah and dwelt in the land of Damascus. Not necessarily the city of Damascus, but in the land of Damascus surrounding the city, and possibly the city as well. Uh, in these days, we had these... Uh, city-states, in which a city controlled uh, 
territory around it and protected territory around it, which was then called the land of, so you have the city of Damascus and here you have the land of Damascus. That's the land around Damascus, which would have been under that city's protection and under that city's, uh, if you had an issue, you would have gone to the Beit Din in that city. This is very important. This is why when Paul went to persecute the original followers of Yeshua, where did he go? Damascus. Why Damascus? Well, because Damascus was the capital of Essenism, and the very first followers of Yeshua, and I mean the very first ones, were Essenes, people who come from an Essene background. Very quickly, uh, a Pharisaic element also uh, 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 joined with them, and uh, the, because Yeshua was a teacher of the school of Hillel, uh, Paul himself was from a Pharisaic background, so was Nachdemon and Joseph of Arimathea, and so there was a Pharisaic element as well. Um, uh, but uh, this is why Paul went to Damascus, and um, uh, when he went to uh, he went to Damascus because Damascus was the birthplace of Essenism, and there was a large Essene following of Yeshua in the uh, uh, at the very beginning. Okay, um, as we continue, um, we're on line. Eleven, in line eleven, uh, none who have been uh, who have been brought into the covenant shall enter into the sanctuary to light up his altar in vain. They shall lock the door, for God said, "Would that one of you should lock my door, so that you should not light up my altar in vain." Malachi one ten, which was apparently one of the passages that they used as a basis for boycotting the temple rituals and ceremonies. And um, notice that it says, none who have been brought into the covenant. They must be careful to act according to the specifications of the law for the era of wickedness, separating from corrupt people, avoiding filthy, wicked lucre, uh, taken from what is vowed to be uh, or consecrated to, to God or found in the temple funds, they must not rob the poor of God's people, making widows' wealth and their booty and killing orphans. Isaiah 60, verse 2. They must be distinguish between defiled and pure, teaching the difference between holy and profane. Now we find out in another document for QMMT, that uh, this group, uh, one of their their um, their di their differences, one of their uh, um, bones they had to pick with the Pharisees, was that they believed that the Pharisees weren't ritually pure enough, and that there was a set of sets of purity laws for known as for Q, known as Maase. Um, uh, Hatorah, the the, the uh, works of the law that they had, uh, f the Pharisees had fallen short in, and were therefore uh, profaning the uh, the temple, profaning the uh, things that should not be profaned, and that the Essenes believed that they could somehow purify their way into righteousness. So that's uh, alluded to here. They must distinguish between defiled and pure, teaching the difference between holy and profane. They must keep the Sabbath day according to specification and the holy days and the fast day according to the commandments of the members of the new covenant of the land in the land of Damascus, offering the holy things according to their specifications. So here we they uh, they have to keep the uh, the Sabbath and the other things in accordance with the halacha effectively the Essene halacha which was very very strict uh, not anything like Yeshua's halacha for those that uh, there there are parallels between 
as we've been showing the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Qumran community, the Essenes, and Yeshua's teach, uh, some of Yeshua's teachings. There were some parallels, but uh, the Essenes were definitely um, very different. Uh, things with they uh, their halacha was definitely not Yeshua's halacha. Uh, and uh, Yeshua's halacha was a whole lot more like Pharisaic halacha, the school of Hillel, than theirs. As we'll find out when we actually get to later in this document, their uh, Sabbath halacha, okay, which is mentioned here. But another important thing here is it says, according to the commandments of the members of the new covenant, or the Brit Chadashah, or the renewed covenant, uh, now, remember earlier it says, referred to those who had been brought into the covenant. And here it says the new, uh, talks about the new covenant in the land of Damascus. So apparently when this group of Jews uh, left Judah and went to the land of Damascus together, they all entered into a covenant which they believed was the new covenant or a renewal of the covenant. And this new covenant involved a commitment to their unique halachot concerning the Sabbath, etc., and purity laws, etc., that we see outlined here and in 4QMMT and in the Manual of Discipline and other documents um, that we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, so it's interesting, an interesting parallel, though, is that these people saw themselves as living in a new covenant and being a new covenant community. Um, Offering the holy things according to their specifications, each one must love his brother as himself and support the poor, needy, and alien. They must seek each the welfare of his fellow, never betraying a family member according to the ordinance. Each must reprove his fellow according to the command, but must not bear a grudge. Day after day, they must separate from all kinds of ritual impurity according to their ordinance, not befoul, befouling uh, each his Holy Spirit, just as God told them to do. In short, for all instructions, God's covenant uh, stands firm to give them life for thousands of generations. And then the, the uh, one of the manuscripts, Geniza B, adds here, as it is written, he keeps the covenant and loyalty to those who love him and keep my commandments for a thousand generations, Deuteronomy 7, 9. So now there's a little statement on marriage. Weiss, Abag, and Cook, uh, their translation they uh, uh, they think this might uh, this is an, uh, that it might be an addendum on marriage uh, that this paragraph may have been misplaced. They're not sure. I'm not saying whether it has or hasn't. Just may, making note of that. And it says, but if they live in camps according to the rule of the land, and one of the manuscripts adds uh, B adds which existed in ancient times, and then it says and marry women, and then that man B again adds as is the custom of the law, and begat children, then let them live in accordance with the law and by the ordinance of vows according to the rule of the law, just as it says between a man and his wife and between a father and his sons. All right, then the next paragraph in the at least Weiss, Weiss, Weiss and Cook's version. Uh, but those who reject the commandments and the rules shall perish. When God judged the land, bringing the just deserts of the wicked to them, what is that? Uh, uh, that is when the oracle of the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, come, uh, came true, which says, Days are coming upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house that have never come before since the departure of Ephraim and Judah. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 17. That is, when the two houses of Israel separated, Ephraim departing from Judah, all who backslid were handed over to the sword, and all who, uh, but all who held fast escaped to the land of the north, as it is said, 
I will exile the tents of your king and the foundations of your images beyond the tents of Damascus. Amos 5.27, and this uh, reference into Damascus, if we understand the context here, is that they're seeing the fulfillment of Amos 5.27 in the origins of their sect at Damascus, where they all went and entered into what they believed at least was the New Covenant together. Uh, the books of the law are the tents of the king. As it is said, I will re-erect the fallen tent of David, Amos 9, 11. The, uh, 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 better translated, the tabernacle of David. It's a passage that you may be familiar with. I will lift up the fallen tabernacle of David. There is another passage in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's in uh, 4Q127, and it's on page 228 of the Weiss, Abeck, and Cook book. Uh, it says, uh, uh, this passage, let's see, uh, and I shall raise up the booth of David, they translate here this time, Tabernacle of David, that is fallen, Amos 9:11. This passage describes the fallen branch of David, whom shall raise up to deliver Israel. Um, so here it's uh, it's uh, also taken there as a messianic passage. So it says here, the king is the leader of the nation and the foundation of your images is the book of the prophets whose words Israel despised. The star is the interpreter of the law who comes to Damascus. As it is written, a star has left Jacob, or comes out of Jacob. A star has risen from Israel, Numbers 24, 17. Uh, this is then referring to the, apparently the teacher of righteousness, the individual, the rod, that uh, led them to Damascus, where they all entered into this new covenant together. The latter is the leader of the whole nation. When he appears, he shall shatter all the sons of, of Seth, Numbers 24, 17, they escaped in the first period of God's judgment, but those who held back were handed over to the sword. Um, and now we're on uh, uh, co uh, column 19 um, in uh, the uh, Geniza B text. When the oracle of the prophet Zechariah comes true, O sword, uh, be lively and smite my shepherd and the um, man loyal to me, so says God, if you strike down the shepherd, the flock will scatter, then I will turn my power against the little ones. Zechariah 13, 7. But those who live, uh, those who give heed to God are the poor of the flock. Zechariah 11, 7 and they will escape in the time of punishment, but all the rest will be handed over to the sword when the Messiah of Aharon and of Israel comes. So, well, let me finish the, the sentence here, and then I'll comment on that. Just as it happened during the time of the first punishment, as Ezekiel said, make a mark on the foreheads of those who moan and lament, Ezekiel 9, 4, but the rest were given to the sword, that makes retaliation for covenant violations. Uh, so notice here it refers to the Messiah of Aharon and of Israel that come, comes. Now, the, uh, the Qumran community believed in two messiahs, uh, and some places they talk about uh, uh, two messiahs and an individual, individual called the prophet, which apparently is the... Uh, uh, the prophet mentioned in uh, Deuteronomy uh, 18, the prophet like Moses. So these two uh, uh, mess messiahs are, one's an Aaronic messiah and one is a kingly messiah. And the uh, uh, one of these messiahs 
has a priestly sort of function, and one of them uh, has the Davidic function. They're very similar to the rabbinic two messiahs, the Messiah of Ephraim and the Messiah of David, Messiah bin Ephraim or bin Yosef and Messiah bin David. Uh, the uh, uh, Aaronic Messiah uh, is, serves some kind of priestly function, and in four, uh, sorry, in eleven Q thirteen, the uh, appears to be the Melchizedek figure that is serving as a heavenly high priest in the uh, heavenly holy of holies, redeeming Israel. Um, all right, let us continue. Um, now we're in column eight. Uh, part of this is jumped around because there's different witnesses to the text, and also when the, uh, I believe when the, this was first published as the Zadokite document, uh, before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they had the pages out of order because they didn't know what, what order they went in, and then when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, the copies we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls told us what the order of the pages were. Uh, we, we previously had found copies in, in the Cairo Geniza. I probably talked about some of this in part one. Uh, as such, in the verdict on all members of the covenant who do not hold firm to these laws, they are condemned to destruction by Belial. That is the day on which God shall judge so uh, 4Q268, which is a, a, a copy of this, adds, as he has said, the princes of Judah were those, and then uh, manuscript B, there's two manuscripts that were found in the Cairo Geniza, A and B, like boundary shifters, on whom I, I shall pour out my wrath, and then B adds like water, Hosea 5.10. Surely they were too sick to be healed, Every kind of galling wound adhered to them, and then manuscript B adds, truly, they had entered the covenant repenting, and then it says, because they did not turn away from the traitorous practices, they relished the customs of fornication, referring back to uh, last week's or the previous teaching, uh, part one, where we talked about the three tap trial, uh, the three traps of Belial, and one of which was um, fornication because they were uh, uh, engaged to more than one, married to more than one wife in their lifetime, and filthy lucre. Each of them vengefully bore a grudge against his brother, each hating his fellow, each of them kept away from the nearest kin, but grew close to indecency. They vaunted themselves in riches and in ill-gotten gains, each of them did just as he pleased, each chose to follow his own willful heart. They did not separate from the people, and then B adds, and their sin, but arrogantly threw off all restraint, living by wicked customs of which God had said, their wine is the venom of snakes, the cruel poison of vipers. Deuteronomy 32, 33. The snakes are the kings of the Gentiles. Now remember Yeshua and uh, Yo uh, Yochanan uh, and both, and, and we found earlier in this document, it talked about the, uh, the eggs of vipers. And here we're talking about snakes. And uh, Yo Yochanan and Yeshua had both talked about uh, a generation of vipers. The snakes are the kings of the Gentiles and their wine is their customs and the poison of vipers is the chief of the kings of Greeks who comes to wreak vengeance on them. But the shoddy wall builders and the whitewashers understood none of these things. For uh, the one who deals in mere uh, wind, a spewer of lies, has spewed on them. And B reads slightly differently. It says, one who walks in wind and who deals in storms who has preached lies to men. This is one of those, one of whose entire company God's anger had burned out. Now, notice it talks about the, uh, not only the snakes and vipers, okay, but then it talks about uh, the, not the shoddy wall builders and whitewashers. So, 
So just like the Essenes, um, the, the Essenes are here calling uh, the uh, Pharisees whitewashers. And this is uh, interesting because Yeshua called Pharisees in uh, certain Pharisees, at least in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, whitened sepulchers. And Paul called Ananias, who was a Sadducee, not a Pharisee, a whitened wall. In, uh, uh, so Yeshua did that in Matthew 23, 27, talking about certain Pharisees being a whitened sepulchers. And Paul refers to Ananias as a whitened wall in Acts 23, 3. Okay, uh, let us continue. Um, again, manuscript B, line 19. This is uh, on page uh, 59 of Weiss, Abeg, and Cook's version. Um, Actually, we're on verse uh, line uh, 14. But as Moses, or B and B adds to Israel, it is not for your righteousness uh, or the integrity of your heart that you are going to, uh, dis uh, to disposes the nations, but because he loved your ancestors and because he kept his promises, Deuteronomy 9, 5 and 7, 8. Such as the verdict of the captivity of Israel and those who turn away from the usages of the common people, because God loved the ancients who bore witness, and then B adds to the people, following him too, he loves those who followed them, for to such truly belongs the covenant of the fathers, but against his enemies, the shoddy wall builders, his anger burns. And then B reads differently. It says, but he hated and despises, he hates and despises the shoddy wall builders and his anger burns hot against them and all who follow them. So you notice that the, uh, the author of this document doesn't like Pharisees at all. Uh, so there is one fate for everyone who rejects the commandments of God and abandons them to follow their own willful heart. Now you realize that these people that means their unique halacha that they associate with their new covenant that they entered into in the land of Damascus. This is the world that Jerem the word that Jeremiah spoke to Baruch, son of Neriah and Elisha, to Geh uh, Gehazi, his servant. Okay, uh, the B manuscripts version, and I'm reading here from Weiss, Abeg, and Cook what they said the B manuscripts version of the moral of the exhortation, the version of the Damascus document in which the, main, uh, the B manuscript is a later copy was more thoroughly revised uh, to reflect the outlook of the sect. Thus, two distinct versions of the text uh, circulated in ancient times and taken together, the Geniza preserves, the Cairo Geniza preserves both versions. So column 19, so it is with all men who entered the new covenant in the land of Damascus that they turned back and traitorously turned away from the fountain of living water. They shall not be reckoned among the council of the people, and their names shall be written in the book from the, de uh, from the day the beloved teacher dies onto the Messiah from Aharon and from Israel appears. Such is the fate of of all who join the company of men of holy perfection and thus become sick of obeying virtu various virtuous rules. This is the type of person who melts in the crucible, Ezekiel twenty-two twenty-one. When the actions become evident, he shall be sent away from the company as if his lot had fallen among the disciples of God in keeping with this wrongdoing, the most knowledgeable men shall punish him until he returns to take his place among the men of holy perfection. When his actions become evident according to the interpretation of the law, which the men of holy perfection live by, in other words, their unique halakha, uh, no one is allowed to share either wealth 
or work with such a one. In other words, somebody that's been disfellowshipped from their community, don't share any work or wealth with them. They're, don't help them in any way. Um, for the Holy One of the, of the Almighty, the Holy Ones of the Almighty have cursed him. Such is the fate for all who reject the commandments, whether old or new, who have turned their thoughts to false gods and who have lived by their willful heart, they have no part in the household of Torah. This group was, uh, uh, they didn't believe that Pharisees and Sadducees or anyone else were real Jews. Okay, um, as Weiss, Abag, and Cook have said somewhere in this edition, I think in the introductory material or whatever, there's a place where they say that the Dead Sea Scrolls teach a message that its authors would have absolutely rejected, and that is that there's more than one way to be Jewish. They will be condemned along with their companions who have gone back to the men of mockery because they have uttered lies against the correct laws and rejected the sure covenant that they made in the land of Damascus. You see, you know, it just hammers this in over and over again. This community began when they made a, entered into a covenant, a new covenant in the land of Damascus. That is the new covenant. Neither they nor their families shall have any part in the household of the law, the Torah. Now from the day the beloved teacher passed away to the destruction, all the warriors who went back to the man of the lie will be about 40, uh, will be about 40 years. Now at that time, God's anger will burn against Israel, as he said, neither king nor prince, Hosea 3.4, nor judge, nor one who exhorts to do, what is, uh, to do what is right will be left. But those who repent of the sin of Jacob have kept God's covenant. They each will speak to his fellow, vindicating his brother, uh, helping him walk in God's way. Uh, and God shall listen uh, to what they say and write a record book of those who fear God and honor his name. Malachi 3.16, until salvation and righteousness are revealed for those who fear God, and you shall again know the innocent from the guilty and those who serve God and those who do not. Malachi 3.18, he keeps, he keeps forth to those who love him and those who keep him for a thousand generations. Exodus 26, as those separatists that left the city of the sanctuary and relied on God in the time of Israel's unfaithfulness when the nation defiled the temple but returned once more to the way of the people in a few matters. Each of them shall be judged in the holy council according to his spirit. But all the members of the covenant who breached the restriction of the law when the glory of God appeared uh, to Israel, they shall be excluded from the midst of the camp and with them all who did evil in Judah when it was undergoing trial. But all who hold fast to these rules, going out and coming in according to the Torah, always obeying the teacher and confessing to God as follows, we have wickedly sinned, we and our ancestors, by living contrary to the covenant laws, i.e. the halakha, of this uh, of, of the Essenes. Just and true are your judgments against us, and do not act arrogantly against his holy laws and his righteous ordinances and his, rel uh, his reliable declarations, and who discipline themselves by the old laws by which the members of the Yachad, the, the, the unity, uh, were governed and listen attentively to the teacher of righteousness, the Moray Zadek, not abandoning the correct laws 
which they hear uh, when they, when they hear them they will rejoice and be happy and exultant and they will rule over all the inhabitants of the earth then god will make atonement for them and they will experience his deliverance because they have trusted in his holy name and we're going to stop there because the damascus document will next go on to the uh, the second portion which is the the actual laws the actual halacha of the community at least as recorded within this particular document so we'll go ahead and uh, and stop there and in part 3 we'll go on to actually uh, cover over cover the halacha of the uh, the Qumran community as recorded in the Damascus document the uh, uh, the the matters about which the Morite Zarek had the teacher of righteousness had taught them and their uh, their halakhot uh, so I hope this helps you understand uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, understand the Damascus document. This is, uh, to me, there's a great deal of demand for people that have been interested in, in, in this material. To me, it's not as interesting as um, the, uh, the Pharisaic material, the, uh, the, the rabbinic literature, uh, the, the, uh, the dynamic approach of, say, the uh, the Talmud, where there's a dynamic debate of various opinions being shared, this is just um, the inter mostly the introductory material. But uh, the the Dead Sea Scrolls primarily just give us their halacha. Uh, they give the basis for it only in this brief, this little history and this flowery language telling us how important this new covenant that they entered into in the uh, land of Damascus in the era of wickedness and how uh, bad, the, how, how wrong everybody else is and how uh, they received this true knowledge and whatnot. Um, but it's very, very different from the rabbinic literature because and in the next part, we'll find out they just kind of lay out. This is what the law is. This is what our halacha is. You know, the the one exception I really found was in the in this document, in part one, when it talked about the uh, 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 the the three traps of Belial, and it gave the reasoning for the uh, uh, the uh, the the so the uh, the the foundation of creation, the Yesod Habriah, sorry, the foundation of creation as the basis for their regulation concerning divorce and polygamy, which parallels, and we talked about that last week, Yeshua's teaching on the same subject in Matthew chapter 19, and they gave the basis for it as being the, uh, the uh, foundation of creation. But most of the time, the Dead Sea Scrolls don't really give any reason for their halakha. They just, other than the teacher of righteousness, delivered this to us, and therefore, that's it. Um, so uh, we'll uh, pick back up on this in the next uh, part, and we'll go through the actual laws that, uh, the Damas that the Damascus document teaches and relays to us that were the uh, uh, the laws of this new covenant that they entered into in the with the teacher of righteousness in the land of Damascus. All right, uh, one more time, I want to encourage you to please donate to support these teachings and this work, and uh, I hope that it's been helpful to you. Shalom, shalom.